Well, hey guys, I want to speak into the issue of parenting, discipleship, and the local church. I get a lot of questions on these topics uh, for good reason. Parenting is an all-consuming responsibility, and we want to be faithful to do it well. Uh, and so parenting, discipleship, and the local church, and the intersect of all of those things uh, just is something that we're thinking about and we're trying to be faithful in. And we have a lot of kids at our church and uh, the number is growing by birth, by uh, new members coming in. And we're having over a hundred kids uh, every Sunday right now at our our services. And, um, and we're a small church. And so <laughs> we're being outnumbered uh, and their energy is far superior. I feel a uh, lethargic, uh, you know, in the evenings and all the, the kids energy. And then we're kind of like, you know, mellowing out in the evening and, and they're not. And, um, but I'm going to do a video on the, the gathering, in, uh, after this, but I wanted to speak into, to this issue a little more broadly first, um, kind of a, a little bit more regarding history, um, the church history, um, and how our church approaches family discipleship and discipleship in the local church and children. Um, and so there's a few books, you know, I would, I would recommend. Um, one, this is just more broadly on parenting. Um, Ted Tripp, Shepherding a Child's Heart. Uh, this has been read, many of you have read this, I'm sure, or familiar. Um, it's a great book. Uh, you should read it at some point. Um, Family Shepherds by Vodi Bauckham. We just finished this in the men's internship, uh, so I reread it last month. Excellent. Every man, look, women, y'all looking for gifts for your dad? Here, here we go. For the husband, there we go. Uh, Family Shepherds by Vodi Bauckham. Every chapter is excellent. This is where I'm more coming from uh, in this video, and what I'm going to say is The Godly Home by Richard Baxter. Uh, you know, I, I've been more influenced personally by the Puritans, by by the Reformers. Uh, there's a book up here. It's called right here called the uh, Theology of the Family, and it's actually published in. Com it's a bunch of compiled sermons from Reform post Reformation and Puritan uh, era on parenting. Uh, it's on marriage and other things as well, but it has a lot on parenting. And, um, and the leadership of our home. And I'm, I've just been highly influenced by uh, what I believe is the most healthy time in church history, uh, early Baptist history um, in, the, in, in the Puritans regarding parenting and, and family worship and things of that nature. So I'm, I'm, I am coming from that perspective. Um, let me back up and say there's a few ways that churches have de dealt with the issue of children uh, in in the corporate gathering uh, historically and you know some just shorten the service right that's a easy practical thing how do you make it easier on parents or kids you just shorten the service um, I'm, I'm not inclined to want to do that I mean maybe we shorten it five minutes I don't know how much that even helps but in terms of substantially shortening a service to an hour or less um, I, I think too much is lost by that type of move. And again, this, this goes back to formative influences and how, uh, how we understand what a healthy and mature church is. We're aimed at becoming and being a healthy, mature church. Um, it seems to me historically the times that the church, is, uh, the church was healthiest is when the corporate gathering was meeting the most, not the least. Um, you know, so you go back to the Puritans and you, you see that they're, they're meeting together four and five hours on Sundays, oftentimes with a morning and evening service, sometimes much longer than that. Um, I'm not advocating for that. I'm just saying to shorten a one service a week time that we all get together into an hour or less is not going to result in the type of maturity and health that we're aiming for. And the times where the church was the healthiest, which I believe was in the times of the Puritans, although not perfect, um, but healthiest, uh, there was a great emphasis on the corporate gathering, and those were long. And the kids were there. And that's the point I want to make, is that the kids were there. 
uh, in those services. So shortening the services uh, is just not going to be something we look at as a serious option. The liturgical um, path is certainly something that we have chosen. Uh, now you can overdo liturgy. Every church has a liturgy um, or the order of your service. I mean, there's some churches that I guess it's literally different every single week, um, but there's still some sort of liturgy there. But we're liturgical on purpose. We have a certain order to our worship. We, 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 uh, liturgy is also a very formative discipleship mechanism that the church has used historically to get engagement. We, so we read together. We sing unto one another and unto the Lord. We pray together. There's all these things that are very interactive. We receive the word eagerly. Um, it's not only biblical, but just historical that liturgy in a service is extremely important. Now, the Catholic Church has liturgy, but they centralize the ordinance at the center piece of the service. So the ordinance is central. Therefore, the, the ministry of the word of the sermon is kind of a, a side issue. Um, from the Protestant tradition, uh, we centralize the word. We believe the gospel word, the proclaimed gospel is the central, the centerpiece of the service. And therefore, it's just going to take longer. You're going to have longer services than if you just simply have the ordinance be centralized. Um, and, and so, uh, now, getting into more modern ways the church has done this, because if we go back and look at, okay, for 1950 years, essentially, the church had all the kids in the service. They didn't have, you know, Sunday school is an, a new invention. It's the 50s, you know, those things, the 60s and 70s, youth groups are coming out. So what did the church do for 1950 years before that? Well, they had the kids there in the church. Now, the whole idea of children's church, and let me say, by definition, that whole term is just wrong. Okay, there is no such thing as a children's church. Uh, the church is baptized believers with the gospel centralized, who have the, the, the proper use of the ordinances, you have, or you have uh, qualified leadership, that you, you have this gathered, regenerate church. When you take the kids out of that and put them into another room, that's not children's church. That's just taking your kids out of the church. And what's tragic about this is that many times a, a, a child is removed from the church at a young age, put into children's church. They grow up into that, then they go into a youth group setting or something, and then they end up going into college and they leave the church. My argument would be they never really experienced the church. You took them out of the church and took them away from the life of the church, the, the gospel where the Holy Spirit most powerfully works through the corporate means of grace, you remove them from all of that. And so what they're rejecting isn't the church, they're rejecting whatever they experienced in those kids' classes. And so that's a new invention. That's 60, 70 years old at the oldest. Historically, the church never did that. Um, and so, some people, when they hear that, they go, oh, okay, so you're family integrated. No, uh, we're not family integrated. Now, I know some churches that were family, what they mean by family integrated is they rent a building, they don't have any rooms for the kids, and therefore all the kids are in the service. Um, because family integrated means you don't provide nurseries and stuff and you're all in the service. Um, but a lot of people, what they mean by family integrated is that... Uh, that the infants, even the, the young children especially, are saints. They're all believers. They're all Christians. Um, they're fully saved. They're fully Christian. And therefore, to remove your kids from the service is to divide your church. It's to do a church split, right? To move your kids out of the service. So, of course, they're there. But we're not coming from that perspective as Baptists. And so, how do we work through this? Well, we started the church 13 years ago preaching through Nehemiah, and Nehemiah chapter 8 is a massive passage in how we think through this. Let me read the first few verses of Nehemiah 8. It says, All the people gathered together as one into the square before the water gate, and they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard. That's key. And on the first day of the seventh month, he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday. So not an hour, not a two-hour service, 
early morning to midday, in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. So are all the circumcised Jewish kids there in the service? No, just those who could understand were required to come. And it says, the ears of all the people, including the children, were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform, pulpit, uh, that they had made for the purpose. So he's preaching the word of God. This is a corporate gathering in the old covenant. And all the circumcised children, kids, young kids, were not there. Just the ones who were able to understand were expected to come. Principle built off of that is uh, that it's not wrong biblically to have a nursery for those who are unable to understand. I don't think that's a far jump from that text to principalize that and to say we are permitted to have a nursery for kids who are unable to understand um, so that those who are able to understand won't be distracted, namely the parents, but maybe people around them. And that we can have some ladies in the church serve those families uh, when we have an, a massive influx of young children like our church does. So we provide a nursery for parents who know their child isn't ready to participate in worship or understand so that that parent isn't distracted and so that they that child doesn't distract others if they're not able to understand. Now, if a parent goes, well, my four-year-old, I think they're able to understand. We do family worship. They're used to sitting. They can pay attention. They're getting some stuff. I want them there. Great. Bring them. Bring them. Uh, it, this is the parent's call at the end of the day. But what we're saying is... Um, the scripture gives a, a principle that those who are able to understand are the ones that were required to come to the corporate gathering. Um, those who are not able to understand were not required or, or expected because they couldn't understand anyway. Um, and so to have them in nursery so that their parents who are exhausted from parenting all week can understand, um, can worship and be revived uh, seems to be a prudent, wise thing to do. And I would say for those five, six, seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds that are coming into the service that are there with us, they get a lot more than you than you would think. I mean, even my six-year-old youngest son, he gets a lot from the service. I don't think he's ever listening, but he, he, he tells me things and I'm going, he, the boy's listening. Um, I mean, my, my oldest son on uh, Citigroup last week or uh, last night, I'm talking about Protestantism and I forget what I was even saying. Um, talking about Protestant denominations and different churches. And, and I mentioned Anglicanism by accident. And my, my son said, uh, you know, respectfully, he raises his hand, dad, I'm not sure if Anglicanism is Protestant. Isn't that Catholic? Isn't that, uh, and there's debate on that. I mean, there's elements of Protestantism and Anglicanism, but my, my son's sitting there, he's engaged. He's listening, right? He uh, he's making a good, legitimate point. He's he's not thinking, oh, this is the time for the adults, and the the kids' time is later. That's when I'll start to listen. No, he all he knows is that city group is a time for him, and and he's 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 hearing the word of God week in and week out in that context. So, step one: parents are the primary disciplers of their children. Uh, we do not want to usurp the authority of godly parents training, disciplining, instructing their children. Proverbs, Ephesians, all it's, everything is emphasizing a father taking the lead in his home and the discipleship of his children and the mother too coming alongside him and having authority over the kids in the training and development of those children spiritually. That's huge. They, it cannot be denied. Um, so the church wants to come alongside those godly parents doing that work. Secondly, we have city groups. These are not small when it comes to the development of our children and their discipleship. The gospel catechism, I mean, who knows how many kids may be saved over the years in the gospel catechism time. We talk about the gospel explicitly in our city groups with the gospel catechism every week our kids know the gospel now they have to believe it and receive it by faith but they know it and the seeds are being planted weekly if you come to city group for no other reason other than that your kids be 
catechized in the gospel every week, I think that is a legitimate reason to come. Um, not to mention that they're singing with their city group. They're fellowshipping and eating and, 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 and building relationships and bearing the burdens of those in that group. This is where the church happens. Um, we've got kid ca kids catechism on, on Sundays, uh, three age groups for that, and that is very helpful. Our teachers do great at giving good, solid doctrine to the kids and teaching them. Um, kids choir is going to get started soon where the kids, uh, as they have in the past, um, will uh, help the church in corporate worship and they sing the songs we sing in corporate worship and we'll stand up there with the band and help lead. Um, excited to have that back soon. Uh, and then we have youth events that have been happening with some teaching and fellowship and heavy parental involvement. And I'm very excited for the teaching that will be happening to the youth more and more especially as we get into the new building. And then the corporate gathering, that is central. Other than the parents teaching all through the week and God's responsibility that he gives to them, uh, the corporate gathering on Sunday is massive for the development of our children. And I'm going to do a whole video on this next. Um, so I'll put it in the, I'll put the link in the, the description to this. Um, but we must gather with the local church on Sunday and see that as a primary place where God will save our children, uh, where God will help us disciple our children, where we call them to worship the God who made them, who loves them, who sent his son to bring them in. And, um, and there's a lot I want to say on that. Um, <laughs> I'll stop it here on that. I, I, I hope you will re, you will listen or watch this uh, this next video on corporate worship um, and the kids engaged in corporate worship because it really is a part two to this. So I'll, I'll lay on the plane here. Blessings, guys. Um, talk to you soon.